Okay, so last week we looked at the introduction that Paul gave to this letter, and you'll remember that uh, uh, it was a rather extensive introduction, uh, un unlike any in his other letters, and this was primarily because this church was not founded by Paul. Paul, Paul had never met these people, he'd never been to this church, and uh, he'd never taught any of these people, and so uh, for the sake of them knowing who he is and being able to uh, give his credentials to them. Uh, the introduction is rather lengthy, but also because Paul seems for some reason to want to give us a, a brief uh, introduction to Christology. He wants to talk a little bit about our Savior in terms that he will not use in the rest of the letter. And so I think it's helpful to see that up front, um, but to, to remember that really uh, what he's going to be focusing on in the letter is really the gospel itself and the uh, implications of, of putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ uh, for us as believers. And in these verses we're going to look at this morning, then, Paul is going to continue and, and actually elaborate on uh, the two key ideas that he gave to us in that introduction. First, he is an apostle primarily to the Gentiles, uh, to non-Jews, and then the gospel that he is entrusted with, which he uh, indicated last time uh, was something that was given to him directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Christ's ambassador to do that. So he begins, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Uh, this is, I think, something that characterizes all of Paul's letters. Uh, he is always genuinely um, grateful to God for the work that he sees of God's grace in the lives of other people. <laughs> I did read one uh, um, commentary. It was actually, uh, I was reading Luther's commentary, and Luther com commented that uh, Erasmus, who was uh, his adversary at the time, called Paul a, uh, you know, a, a fraud or a phony for, for making these statements. Like, well, he's just trying to butter them up. <laughs> but, but if we look at what Paul says in all of his letters, he genuinely loves people, and he, he recognizes God's grace. And, and um, when he says first here, uh, there's no sequence. There's no second and third. So really, I think we take that word to mean primary importance. Paul says, this is really significant to me that, um, that I thank God for the grace that I see in your lives. And I kind of convicted me because I don't always do that. You know, when God brings people to mind, I don't always thank God and say, wow, Lord, look what you're doing mm -hmm. in so-and-so's life. And I think that's a reminder that that's important. Mm -hmm. And he focuses on the fact that it's through Jesus Christ. That is that that uh, he's really focusing now on his thanksgiving. It comes to God through Christ. Christ is the mediator, allowing us to come uh, to the Father and to come into his presence. But also he's the one uh, for whose sake our prayers and our praises are actually answered and um, <clears throat> responded to by God. Um, but again, it's for all of you. Uh, that is for the Roman Christians. And here's the primary reason that Paul's thankful it's because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Now, clearly that's a little bit of hyperbole. It, it certainly wasn't that the whole world knew about these people. There were probably large portions of the world that were unaware of them entirely. But from Paul's perspective, the then known Roman Empire um, apparently was fairly familiar with the fact that in Rome, there was a significant number of Christian believers and, uh, and that their faith uh, and the strength of that faith, the character of that faith was spoken of throughout the then known empire. It's, I think it's a significant st uh, testimony to these people that the way they were living uh, really had caught people's attention. And hopefully he would say that about each one of us if he had known us or were, were able to know us that he would want to proclaim that about our faith as well. Then Paul says, for God is my witness. And then he takes a, <laughs> another detour. So I'm going to save that phrase for the next phrase because, uh, because he modifies God, God whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And what's interesting here is that the word serve really focuses on Paul's service as an offering of uh, worship. Uh, he uses another term very similar to that in Romans 12 when he talks about a, a sacrifice acceptable to God. 
he's actually talking, he uses the word for worship. And I think what Paul is doing there is he's reminding us that when we serve God faithfully, when we serve him with our gifts and abilities that he gives to us, we're actually worshiping God when we do that. And, um, and in this particular case, Paul's saying he worships um, God in, in the gospel of his son, in proclaiming that gospel, in uh, explaining that gospel, in developing that gospel uh, in the lives of, of believers. Uh, Paul is actually worshiping his God and doing that. And he says he does it with his spirit. <clears throat> that is, it's not just outward obedience. Uh, it's really from the heart. It's really from um, his spirit that he worships God and serves God uh, again with that gospel. So now if we go back, uh, for God is my witness actually modifies the next phrase, that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. Again, Paul uses that phrase a lot. Uh, I don't think he means to say that 24-7 he's constantly praying for those people. But I think what he means to say is that on a regular basis, as God brings them to his mind, he's in prayer for them. He does it frequently. He does it regularly. And uh, he always keeps them before him. And, and remember, these are people he's never met. Uh, what causes him to want to pray for them is because he knows they're believers, and he's excited about that. And again, I think it's a reminder to us that uh, there's real value in thanking God for each other and for uh, those maybe we haven't even met but have heard about their faith, and also in, uh, in praying for them that their faith will continue to be strong and they will continue to have an impact uh, in ministry wherever they are. But there's more to Paul's prayer than just that. And again, here is where we, we begin to see what Paul really would love to see accomplished in his life with regard to these uh, Roman Christians. He says, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So Paul's been praying. And I think we know not just from Romans, <clears throat> but from other places that Paul really longs to go to Rome. He really longs to have a ministry there, and he's never been, um, but he is, uh, he's willing to subordinate his wishes, his desires to God's will. Uh, he wants it to be God's will that he goes, and he doesn't want to go if that's not God's will, uh, but he's hoping that uh, by God's will, God will allow him to go and to have a ministry there. And so he now tells us what he hopes that ministry will be. And he actually uses three statements that are pretty similar, uh, but kind of bring out little nuances in what it is that he, uh, that he hopes to accomplish. Uh, he says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That word, spiritual gift it, it's we use it all the time <laughs> i mean we know exactly what we mean by it it's a little confusing to what what paul means by it because he doesn't usually use that phrase in fact i think it's only used here so some of the possibilities and i really don't know what he is referring to exactly but i think we can see that all of them would fit perfectly in in this category of a spiritual gift to strengthen someone it could be miraculous gifts um, they're not usually called by this phrase, but we do know that the miraculous gifts were available to particularly to the early church. And in fact, uh, some of the miraculous gifts anyway, we see um, in the book of Acts being conferred by the laying on of hands of the apostles themselves. So it's possible that when Paul got there, he intended to do that. Um, he could have also been referring to fruit of the spirit or to some uh, insight um, or ability. Paul often uh, provided some great insights to the people when he was there with them, like uh, uh, a deeper insight into the word that they, that they didn't know, or even answering questions that they had. Uh, you remember the Thessalonians were uncertain about what was going to happen to the, the Christians who had died uh, before Christ returned. They were upset that they wouldn't be part of the, uh, you know, of, of Christ's coming and, and benefit. And so as Paul explained that to them, it, it brought them great comfort and encouragement. So oftentimes the gift that Paul imparted was just a, a, a better understanding of the word and of what, uh, what God was doing 
Um, but it could have been uh, that he intended to impart, like I said, more knowledge, more grace, uh, even power possibly. Um, but the whole purpose was to strengthen them. That was to increase their confidence, increase their obedience, um, increase their encouragement. Yes, go ahead. Larry. Is it possible that in the context, he was wanting to use his personal spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit to do for Rome what he had done for the others when he's there, that equipping them uh, to, to be able to please and glorify God? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All of these are possibilities. Maybe all of them are, yeah. are, are to be included. We're going to see in some cases where we say that these are possibilities. So they all seem like maybe they're all going to be included in that. And this is certainly true as long as we and, and we look at, you know, I gave you the, the first and second Thessalonians. Uh, the first one is has to do with Timothy. Why was Timothy sent to bring comfort, to bring encouragement? So this is happening all the time. Paul is sending out people to do this kind of work among uh, those that he's led to faith in Christ or those that he's ministered to. And so here, what Paul is saying is, I would like to do it in person rather than send someone uh, who might impart a different mm -hmm. gift or ability. Um, but that's one of the reasons why he wants to visit is he sees a real value uh, in his being there in terms of what he can give to them. But then it says, he says, that is, verse 12, here he's not really correcting what he has to say, but I think he's enlarging upon it. And really what he wants to say is, yes, I have something to bring to you. But then he says that we may be mutually encouraged. It's not just that I'm giving you something and you have nothing to give me back. He says that we would be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So Paul really is looking for some mutual comfort, mutual encouragement, mutual strengthening. He sees them as having a ministry in his life as well. And he says by each other's faith. And he doesn't mean that their faith is somehow different than his. That is, you know, they, they don't believe in Jesus Christ or they don't believe the same way. What he means, I think, as I understand it, is that each one of us brings a, we bring the same faith, but we have different experiences in that faith. We have different ways that that faith has affected our lives, um, different things that we can share uh, with each other that can be an encouragement or strengthening. Uh, I think one of the things that, and I'm sure Larry, when he was on the board and he heard testimonies of people, uh, the way God works in different people's lives is really an encouragement to us because it's never the same. It's always, wow. <laughs> and so as we talk to each other about what God's doing in our lives, how he's developing our faith, we are encouraged. And I think that's what Paul has in mind. He doesn't have the same experiences that they've had. He doesn't have sometimes even the same insights or perspectives that they have. But as they begin to share, there's going to be a growing together uh, in, um, in um, strengthening of that faith. And then he makes this comment, uh, verse 13. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. So it's not only that Paul has longed to see them. <laughs> It's not only he's been praying about going to see them and praying that God would uh, grant that desire, but he's also made plans on, on more than one occasion to come and see these people, and yet they have not worked out. He says, but thus far I have been prevented. Most likely what has been preventing him is his uh, apostolic work, his apostolic labors. If you look at the book of Acts, I gave you just one example in 1519, but he is constantly being pressed upon uh, to help here, to minister there, and it just keeps him busy 24-7, and he really does not feel, I think, the freedom to leave the ministries he's in. I think we talked last week, he's writing this from Corinth. Well, Corinth needed a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Three months worth. <laughs> yeah, more than he probably was able to give it in the time that he had. Uh, he just couldn't see leaving, and many times he was ready and ready to move on, and things would come up. But it is possible also that the Spirit had forbidden him or had kept him from, from moving into Rome uh, as the Spirit had forbidden him to preach in Asia. So we don't know exactly what he means, but I think it's most likely that he was just so busy, and the ministry was so significant that he was carrying on that he, he didn't feel the freedom to leave. 
But then this is the third phrase that really means the same, about the same thing as the other two. But again, you can see a little nuanced difference. He said, it is in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So again, the idea of harvest is a product, an outcome. When we think of a harvest, we think of something that comes at the end of the growing season that we get to bring it in and enjoy it. Um, and, and so Paul sees uh, this is the outcome is, of his apostolic efforts that there would be, um, when he talks about harvest, I think he means a couple of things. One is, I think he really does desire to go to Rome, uh, not to evangelize these Christians, but those around them, those in their midst. Uh, there may have been a lot of people that were not believers that were associated with uh, these people, and he wants to administer the gospel to them. But I think also this idea of evangelism in, in Paul's mind also includes strengthening, encouraging, developing a deeper relationship with Christ among those who already were believers. And so I think he sees both of those things as the harvest. Again, if you look at this, he, uh, this phrase, he said it's among uh, the rest of the Gentiles. So Paul also is seeing this church as largely Gentile. And we talked last week about how it probably had uh, Jewish origins, but because of Claudius, who drove most of the Jews out of the city, at this point in time, it's largely Gentile, but not entirely. And, um, and so we have to keep that in mind, but it is largely Gentile. Paul recognizes that. And because he's a, an apostle to the Gentiles, what an opportunity. <laughs> to go and to minister uh, to these people. So he says, verse 14, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, this is an interesting phrase, both to the wise and to the foolish. So this is the source of why he desires to have this harvest, is he still senses his calling. You remember in the beginning of this letter, he said he was set apart for the gospel and that he was to be an ambassador to the Gentiles. And uh, so I, I was thinking there of 1 Corinthians 9, 16, which, where Paul says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. It's what motivated Paul. Uh, <laughs> it was his calling, his, his ministry. And so it drove him forward. Every place he could go to preach the gospel, he wanted to go. And now he's saying, I, I long to be... Uh, to be doing that among Greeks and barbarians. Um, the word barbarian is an interesting word. It's actually a figure of speech that we call today onomatopoeia, which means that the word, when it's spoken, it sounds like what it's intended to mean. Um, it doesn't come across in English quite that way, but when you say the Greek word, it sounds like it's a primitive sound to a cultured ear. Um, so the idea of barbarian is uncultured, uh, you know, kind of a backwoods kind of person who can't really talk very well English. And even when we say the word, even though it, it doesn't have that same connotation, when we say barbarian, <laughs> it's like, yeah, all right, you barbarian is, you know, you're, you're, you're not cultured, you're not civilized, you're from the back, backwoods. Uh, primitive. And that's really the idea. To the Greeks, everybody else was uncultured. Mm, now, the Romans. Like, it's kind of like Jews and Gentiles. That's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the Greeks, the Jews would have been barbarians. They would have been <laughs> barbarians, absolutely. And uh, probably most of the Romans, too. Mm -hmm. But the Romans probably thought themselves to be Greeks mm -hmm. in that sense. We're cultured. We have a great culture. We have mm -hmm. as good a culture as the Greeks have. Uh, but all you others out there, you're in the barbarian category. And so uh, here he is, I think, saying, I'm going to minister to the cultured. I'm going to minister to those that you consider to be uncultured. doesn't matter to me. And then the wise and the foolish. And here, I think we, we don't want to see this as the way that the Bible normally describes wise and foolish. The wise is the one who fears the Lord and the foolish is the one who doesn't. These are people who think they're wise, who think they're intellectual, mm -hmm. who think they've got, you know, that they've got something to contribute. Again, that's what the Greeks thought. Look at our civilization. You know, it's the... It's it could the, have been interpreted educated and uneducated. Yes, yes. educated, uneducated. Exactly. Um, you know, different than culture. Here, mm -hmm. the idea is knowledgeable. Mm -hmm having knowledge, you have nothing. And so, uh, again, Paul says, um, 
I'm here to minister to those who think they're smart <laughs> and to those who recognize that they really aren't. Um, it doesn't matter to him. If you're a Gentile, you fit into this category. Now, Larry's right. The Jewish people would have been in, this, in, in the category of barbarian and foolish, um, according to the Greeks. I don't think the Jews are, are in the forefront of Paul's thought here because he's already said um, that his focus is Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And so he's really looking at the Gentile culture and, and classifying it according to the way the Greeks looked at it um, and even some of the Romans. Uh, but certainly, if you were a Jew, you would have been considered a barbarian in, in the Greek thinking. And of course, the Jews would have thought, well, you're just a Gentile in our <laughs> thinking, and you don't belong here anyway. So you can see the animosity, and you can see the difficulty, I think, in the early church when you begin to combine Greeks and cultured and uncultured and Jews, and now you've got some issues, and that's one of the reasons why I think Paul later on, in particular chapters 14 and 15, talks about just you have christian liberty but let's not run over each other mm -hmm. in the process of, of exercising that liberty and so paul says and finally so i am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in rome uh, again this idea of preach the gospel is ongoing work teaching discipleship all that goes with that um, but because he's under obligation he's excited to preach and uh this really concludes then the, I guess we could say the introduction to his letter because mm -hmm. it sets forth who he is. It sets forth his desire um, to minister to them and what he hopes to accomplish. Um, but now he's going to transition uh, to um, the theme of the, of the rest of the letter. I tend to call it a book, but it really is a letter. <laughs> I've never written a letter anywhere near this long, so <laughs> it's more of a book. Um, any questions or comments from anyone before we move into verses 16 and 17, which really set the stage for the rest of the letter? Anyone? Okay. So when we get to verses 16 and 17, these are transitional verses. We begin to move again away from Paul's emphasis on his own ministry and now onto the theme um, that Paul is going to carry out throughout the rest of, of the letter. And the theme, if you look at a number of commentaries, the theme will be variously stated. And I think I said last week that for years I said it was justification by faith. Um, I guess I was a Luther fan. <laughs> and that's what Luther saw the theme to be. I think now that's too narrow. I think it includes justification by faith. But Paul is speaking broader here. Uh, he's the, the most inclusive term that I could come up with is just simply the gospel. The gospel is the theme. What is the gospel? What is what what is entailed in the gospel? What are the benefits of the gospel to the person who receives Christ by faith? Um, how does that work itself out in your life as a, as a believer? All of those things are included in this letter. And uh, justification by faith is part of it, but it isn't all of it. Um, there's whole chapters that have nothing to do at all with justification by faith. So I think um, if we keep the broader perspective, um, it, it's helpful, I think, to see how things fit together in the letter. And so Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Um, and just a reminder, I think for all of us, and especially for, for, for uh, uh, as we look at the word, is when we see the word for or because or therefore, <laughs> I know the old phrase, if we see the word therefore, we should ask what it's there for. But mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to realize that it's always a reason for something that's gone before. It always helps you to understand the previous phrase. Um, and so when you're doing Bible study, when you see that word for or because or therefore, uh, you want to just look back at the last phrase or so and say, uh, how does this help me to understand it? And I think if we do, what we see is Paul's eager to preach the gospel. Why? Because he's not ashamed of it. You know, what keeps us from sharing the gospel? A lot of times it's because we are a little bit ashamed of it. Um, you know, we, we live in a culture that thinks it's 
ridiculous, thinks it's stupid, thinks it's foolish. Paul did too. And I do want to read you those verses in 1 Corinthians because I think they do bear so much on uh, what, uh, on this phrase that Paul gives us because he, he's very clear to the Corinthians. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. And let me just read that to you. He says, for, let me back up. Uh, let me back up to 21. Uh, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So Paul admits to the Corinthians, the world thinks what we're doing by preaching Christ is just plain foolish. And the Jews trip over it constantly. Mm -hmm. they, they, they can't accept a crucified Messiah. But Paul's not ashamed of that gospel because he knows it really is the wisdom of God. And he's not embarrassed by the fact that that's how God's chosen to save people. And I think, um, I keep asking myself, why, why, am I, why, why do I struggle sometimes to get it out when I know he's right here, that, that we should not be ashamed of the gospel. It actually saves people. And, uh, and it's because of the next phrase. It's also beginning with a four. Um, for or because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I look at the church today, and uh, you know we've really moved away from the preaching of the word, not in this church, um, and not in evangelical churches, but in the church, particularly of America, uh, particularly with the um, church growth movement starting back in the early 70s. Uh, the, the thinking was the preaching isn't going to bring people in. We need to, <laughs> we need to have movies. We need to have drama. We need to have this and that and the other thing, and then we'll bring them in. Um, but what Paul says is no, the gospel is not only what they need to hear and really meets the deepest desires of their heart, but it's the power of God that actually changes lives, brings brings about change that I'm sorry you know drama is neat and sometimes helpful but drama doesn't change people's lives it's the gospel um, which displays the power of God this word power I think most of you know it's the word dunamis in Greek and it's the word from which we get our word you know, dynamite <laughs> which back then was the big boom today we have more powerful stuff but we see from that concept of that it's a, it's the dynamite of God which actually um, changes lives. In fact, when Paul says it's the power of God, he is using um, the basically the way the Old Testament saw uh, God's power, and that is a, it's a the power of a personal God um, that He possesses and able and is able to manifest in a way that delivers His people. And again, uh, just a, just one reference, Psalm seventy-seven. I thought um, said it pretty well. I'm Psalm 77. <laughs> Verses 14 and 15 says, You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. So here the psalmist has recognized the power of God to actually bring about the salvation of his people. Um, and in the Old Testament, salvation was seen to a large extent that way. It was deliverance from God's enemies, deliverance from evil. Um, Paul uses it strictly of spiritual deliverance here. Um, but again, this idea of God uh, bringing forth his power to deliver or even to judge. The Jeremiah passage says that, that the people, as God takes them into captivity, because that's what Jeremiah's message was, they're going to see his power. Um, in, in judgment, but then eventually they'll see his power and deliverance. And so um, Paul uses that background and said, the gospel is this. It displays, it brings forth the power that God possesses to bring about the salvation of his people. 
Now, the idea of salvation, uh, I think we know this, but it's, we need to keep it in mind. The picture of salvation ultimately in scripture is salvation uh, from the judgment of God on, on the last day. That's really what the picture is. When we stand before God on the last day, we will not be condemned uh, because we have been saved through uh, the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will be exonerated and, and have all the blessings that, that, that go with that. Um, so it's really a, what we, we call this an eschatological uh, look. Uh, that is, it's the future. And it's the very end of the future um, that we're looking at. But at the same time, uh, salvation does include many of those blessings right now so that Paul can actually say in the present tense, you are saved. You are even now uh, reaping the benefits of what really is an end, uh, an end time a thing. And so uh, it's really both. Uh, we, we often say that, you know, it's already, but not yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's here, uh, but it's not here in fullness. We're still looking for the fulfillment of it, complete fulfillment of it, but it's already in our, our presence even now. And so that's Paul's picture. And he says it's to everyone who believes. Um, that is, it's universally applicable to everybody. Mm. And without distinction, both Jews and Greeks, that's everybody. Um, in, in, in that, um, when you say that, if you weren't a Jew, you were a Gentile or a Greek. Uh, and so Jews and Greeks really covers it all. And it's received by faith. What's interesting here. And you'll see it, I think you're going to see it other places in Paul's gospel. Uh, he says, to anyone who believes, believes what? <laughs> you get to just believe anything you want? Um, no, but Paul often does that. He assumes that you know he's talking about Jesus Christ as the object. But sometimes he just doesn't say it. It's, uh, it's, 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 all, it's like, you ought to know that because I've said it so many times. And so he just leaves it off. Well, but that is what there's he, only so much room on the scroll <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't think so the way he writes <laughs> you think that that scroll went on forever so just briefly uh you know when we talk about belief we're talking about faith and i know nate covered this really well in his sermon a couple of weeks ago um and he used the actual the example that i i love to use the example of a chair um but i think it's helpful just to remind ourselves even at this point of what faith really is. It is composed of three elements. The first is knowledge of the object that we're considering. Um, if we take that chair that you guys can see right here, they can't see it. But you know, if you're looking at that chair, you, you wanna know, well, who made it? Um, was it made in China? No, uh, <laughs> you know, who made it and how well is it made? Does it look like it's made, you know, bolted in well, good steel back and, and feet, or is it just kind of put together wobbly and, and things are missing, or uh, maybe they're not bolted in real well, or I know Nate showed a picture of a chair that wouldn't even stand up <laughs> if you tried to, tried to sit in it, but we, we make a decision uh, by first knowing the object, and so we need to know who, who is Jesus Christ, and Paul's already told us many things about Christ, and he's going to tell us some more as we go along, but we need to know that he's the eternal son of God. Um, he's the second person of the Godhead. He became fully man that he might uh, live among us and, um, and die for our sin and, uh, and live a perfect life of obedience. So we're going to talk about righteousness in just a minute. His righteousness is actually given to us. It clothes us. And uh, so those are the things we need to know about Jesus. Um, and, and maybe many other and then there's a sense that is we have to we have to agree that it's true uh, I can learn all about that chair as much as I want but at some point I have to believe that it's well made <laughs> I have to believe that it actually can hold me if I sit in it and I think the same is true about Jesus Christ we, we can know a lot about Jesus but at some point we have to believe it's true have yes. you heard the story of the flying Walinda? Yeah, I, no, I've never heard that. Never, story. Okay, that one's one of my favorite. Uh, well, the, if everybody knows it, I won't tell it. Uh, well, Pastor Cherry has used the, the great, was he? It was a great Walinda? Oh, he uses a different. I, you know, the Walindas were the trapeze artists. Yes, and so it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And he uses what? one. He uses the one about the guy who crosses Niagara, Niagara, Niagara Falls, Falls on the tightrope. Pushing right. on the tightrope, yeah. And then calls the mayor or some important person. Do you believe I could do it again? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, you can do it. Nobody will get in the barrel. Nobody will get in the barrel. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a great illustration because first we have to believe it, but 
the people believe that, but then the next thing is, do you trust? Mm -hmm. Do you actually trust in what you believe? And the only way that you can do that in the chair is yeah. sit in it. Mm -hmm. If you won't sit in the chair, then it doesn't matter what you know or what you assent to. You don't have faith until you sit in it. And with Jesus, it means that you're trusting him and him only for your salvation. And uh, we have to rely on, we have to trust. And, and that idea of trust is going to come up at the very end when we talk about Habakkuk. That's where trust, where Paul brings back in this concept of trust, um, trusting God. So, but there's a couple phrases that we need to look at before. First is, he says it's, um, <clears throat> well, we've already, uh, oh, yeah, I think we, just a comment on to the Jew first and also to the, gent to the Greeks. Um, certainly this is true in terms of history. It was offered to the Jew first. The whole mm -hmm. Old Testament is about God saving uh, the Jewish people. And it was certainly Paul's pattern of ministry. Everywhere that Paul goes, he went into the synagogue first to preach to his people. And then after being rejected or maybe there was some response, uh, he moved on to the Gentiles where he, where he uh, focused the, the, um, the predominant part of his ministry. And I think all along, um, we see that Paul understands that, that the promises that God made were promises that were first given to Israel and are still primarily for Israel. And God and Paul never, um, never denies the validity of those promises to God, to uh, the Jewish people. Even though he admits, we'll see in chapters 9 and 10, that for now uh, the Jew has been rejected. Um, it's never a final rejection. God has a plan for them. God has a plan to restore them. And so therefore, um, they're always at the forefront. And I think that's what he means by first. It's not just that it came to them first, but also um, uh, they're still a primary importance, but so are the Gentiles. Um, and that's why he says all to, also to the Greek. Uh, this gospel is not just for Jews. It's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then he says, yes, I'm sorry. Can I interject something here? Yes. You were talking earlier um, on 16 when you were talking about for everyone who believes and you were talking about the chair. Well, I'm going back to verse nine because Paul specifically says here, he doesn't just say the gospel. He says the gospel of his son. And I think that in reading about faith and in reading about the word that this is really important because he re refers to the gospel of his son. And then in 15, he refers preach the gospel. And then in 16, he says, not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. Okay, you, you're saying that the, the focus is on the son right from the beginning. I think it is. Yes, I, I agree it is. Yeah, I, I agree. That's why Paul doesn't always say it, uh, the object. I mean, I, I would say for those who believe in Jesus Christ, I think I would have said that. But Paul sometimes just says for those who believe, because it's, because it's clear from what he has said that it is Jesus Christ who is the object of the gospel itself. Right? Yeah. Okay, right. good. No, that's good insight there. The context would say, you can't go anywhere else. And I think that's absolutely true. You can't. There is, you don't just get to believe in anything you want. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think, I think that that's important because I think today a lot of people throw out the word gospel and it does, the connotation is the word of God, you know, whatever the word of Right. Yeah. God, no, the it, gospel is about the son. son. The gospel. So, that, so that's what I'm thinking as I was reading that. Excellent. No, that's good, Barb. The, the gospel has its object in Jesus, and so does salvation. Um, and faith, um, belief, has to have an object as well. We can't just believe. Uh, well, I don't know. I, Disney says, isn't there a song, Just Believe? 
Hmm. Isn't that the one in the in that what's that the the oh, Polar it? Express? Oh, Polar, Polar Express. Express. I think there's a song in there that says just believe. You believe in what? You still have to have an object. You can't just believe. You have to believe in something. Right. And the gospel is believing in in the work of the Son, in the person and work of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's the key phrase now. For in it, here's the word for again. Mm -hmm. um, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Two things I want to say about that. Uh, the word revealed sounds like it means made visible or manifest. But the way Paul uses that word, particularly in 18, when he says, um, for I am, no, excuse me, for the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. He's talking about something that's not just manifest, but something that's actually coming into existence um, mm -hmm. because of what is happening. God is actually not just displaying his, his wrath. He's actually pouring out his wrath mm -hmm. uh, on mankind. And in the same way, the, the gospel doesn't just reveal God's righteousness. It actually brings into being that righteousness in a very, in a very real way. Uh, but it, but there's three, um, it's really interesting, there's three major ways that the church has looked at this phrase, the righteousness of God, and um, I think they're all right. <laughs> I think all three ways are not only correct, but they're all also the way Paul has uses the phrase later on in the book of Romans at one time or another. I think he has all three in mind. Um, and uh, if you try to look at the context, if you try to look at the use of the word righteous, um, righteousness, um, and, and look at some of the other things, you can't separate these three. You can't figure out which one is actually um, in the mind of Paul when he does this. And so what you actually see is many interpreters actually combining them together and saying, this is, <laughs> so that's, I think that's a good way to look at it because as we go through these, I think you're going to see, if you keep these in mind, you're going to see how Paul brings out uh, the various aspects of the righteousness of God throughout the book in different ways. Uh, but all of these are a, a, a correct understanding of that phrase. The first phrase is the phrase that was really predominant in the early church. And that is that the phrase, the righteousness of God, referred to, to an attribute of God, such as his justice or his faithfulness. That is, God was actually carrying out his faithfulness by keeping his promise to redeem a people. God was actually showing, not just showing, but actually carrying out his justice. You remember, God laid aside his justice for a time so that he could pour out his justice on his son. And he wouldn't have to do it for those who would put their faith and trust in Christ. So we see his justice not only being seen, but actually being um, accomplished uh, in the work of Jesus. So that's the first view. The second view was Luther's view. Um, and it predomin predominated in uh, the uh, all of the Protestant reformers pretty much accepted Luther's view. And Luther saw this as a status given by God. It was a righteousness that was not his own. This for Luther was key because Luther, for much of his early life, tried to be right with God on his own. He kept trying and trying to do the right thing. And every time he failed, he would confess. He confessed so much that his confessors you know, were worn out by the fact that Luther would spend hours uh, confessing things that they thought were just inconsequential. <laughs> and you know, they just couldn't get rid of him. But it was because he was trying to be right with God on his own. And he was angry at God because he couldn't do it. And he didn't understand um, how to have a right relationship with God until he understood this verse. And so he saw it then as uh, what he called and what the reformers called an alien righteousness. Now, that does not mean it's the righteousness of E.T. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a foreign being. Um, but it, I, what, I think if we said foreign righteousness, it doesn't belong to us. Mm -hmm. It's actually Christ's righteousness, which is given to us. And it's a status because, um, because it, it, it is a declaration of God. I, I use the word, it's a forensic term. It's a judicial term. It's a declaration that we are, as a result of what Christ has done for us and are accepting that by faith, we, we stand forgiven. 
We stand uh, in a position of righteousness before God because we have been clothed in Christ's righteousness, but we are not righteous. Um, and the difference is, and, and importantly so, because against the Church of Rome at the time, the Roman theology, Catholic theology, says that when a person trusts in Christ, they are actually infused with righteousness and they become righteous. Um, and that makes actually no sense. <laughs> um, not only theologically, you're going to see later on in, in the letter, Paul addresses that issue and, and puts it to rest. But actually, experientially, I think that would really upset me if I thought that I was actually righteous in the sense that the Catholic Church views it, because I realize in my heart I'm not that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my experience says I'm not that. Um, so Luther, I think, is right. It is a status before God. It is a, a declaration that we are forgiven, not guilty. Actually, we stand before God as righteous, but only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. And then there's the third view, which is basically it denotes an activity of God in establishing right. That is, it's his saving action. Uh, it's, it's making things right. Um, and again, I think that kind of goes along with the others. And again, all three of these, um, I think you're going to see um, Paul brings out them one way or another later on in the letter. Um, but I think it's important to think about them now and realize that, wow, this is an amazing thing, really, when we think about what the gospel actually um, brings about uh, in terms of this righteousness. Um, I think the very least we can say is it's a righteousness of which God is the author, and it's a righteousness of which God approves. And then Paul says in my version, from faith for faith, some translations say from uh, faith from first to last, uh, I think there's two possibilities here as well. One is that uh, there's some kind of movement or development. Uh, we could say it's faith starting with a weak faith to a stronger faith. Um, a lot of the uh, commentators think it means starting with the Jewish faith and moving to the Gentile faith because Paul's been talking about that progression. Uh, or it can simply mean, um, as some translations say, from faith to faith. And the idea is it starts with faith and it ends with faith and it's faith all, all in between. It's all of faith. It's not of works at all. And Paul, of course, later says that in Romans. It's all of faith. It's not a, not a work lest any, any man should boast. So either way, I think we look at it, we see that it, it is a matter of faith. And certainly we could say that, you know, the gospel is certainly a righteousness of God that comes into our lives and grows our faith um, hmm. over time. Interesting. I've always saw that as the, it starts off, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, which causes me to share the gospel, which results in my faith leading to somebody else's faith to, to salvation. It's the passing on of the faith. Actually could, could mean that too. Okay. Sure. That's a progression. Right. So it's, that's I'm no different. Right. Yeah. I'm not ashamed. Yeah. Therefore the righteousness is seen by others and resulting in faith from them that leads them to not be ashamed of the gospel and be in it. Yeah. Yes, no, that's, that's, when we talk about progression, I only gave you a couple examples of progression, okay. but you gave me another <laughs> yeah. one, yeah, absolutely, yeah, it can, faith to faith could mean the, the progression from yours to theirs, mm -hmm. just as it would be from Jew to Gentile, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, we can't really distinguish, and we can see that it's, it's both of those, it's all of those, um, and so we're not exactly sure what Paul means, but we can see that either way we look at it, that's exactly what we see happening, and then he finishes, um, with the phrase, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And here he pulls this right out of Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, verse 4, uh, which is the biblical basis and summary of what he has to say. And if you've got your Bibles, I would like you to turn just briefly to Habakkuk. If you have not read Habakkuk uh, recently, I would encourage you to do that, but I'll, I'll, I'm not going to read so much from it. Uh, but I want to give you a, just the background of the story. Um, it starts with Habakkuk complaining. Uh, he says, oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear oh, or cry to you violence. And you will not say, why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Almost sounds like he's talking about a foreign country. 
He's talking about God's people. What, what he's saying is, these people that you've made me a prophet of just do wickedness all day long. He says, and the covenant promises are that when they sin, you bring curses. You, you bring punishment. Where are you, Lord? I keep preaching to these people about repentance, about obedience, about faithfulness, about walking with you. And they don't do it, and you're not doing anything about it. So his complaint is that these people that you've sent me to are wicked, and, and, and you're not doing anything. And so God's answer is, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astonished. For I am doing a work in your day that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own and so forth. God says, okay, says, I'm about to do something about that. I'm going to use the Babylonians. Now, this just floors Habakkuk. You're going to do what? <laughs> You're going to use the most wicked people on the face of the earth to punish your people? I mean, this is astounding. It would be like saying, uh, you know, assuming America were actually a godly people, it would be like saying, I'm going to judge America by using ISIS. Uh, to, to bring it about um, but the prophet is just blown away by what God has to say you can't be serious about this and so there's this dialogue that goes back and forth between Habakkuk and God and finally God says look you need to trust me in this and in uh, Habakkuk 2 4 he says behold his soul uh, that is uh Not only the soul of, of the Babylonians, but also the one who won't believe. His soul is puffed up. It is not right within him, but the righteous shall live uh, by his faith. And so uh, what he's saying to Habakkuk is, look, there's going to come a time when you're going to have to trust me and what I'm doing. Because there are people that won't believe. And even the Babylonians aren't going to believe, and ultimately I will judge them for that unbelief. But that's what I'm going to do. And you need to live righteously by your faith. You need to trust me um, in this. You need to live that way uh, before me. And, and really, that's what he's talking about. The Hebrew word that he uses in Habakkuk denotes a steadfast reliance on the Lord, a trust that perseveres. Um, because in this land filled with violence and now, it's going to be filled even more with violence as this violent nation comes against it. Um, the Lord promises that one day for a remnant, there's going to be restoration, but they have to wait for it. And so um, the difference is Paul brings it forward now, and he says it's, the righteous one is no longer an Israelite who's living out his life um, of faith as Habakkuk was. Uh, but it's any one Jew or Gentile who comes to faith in Christ and therefore obtains eternal life. Um, Habakkuk does trust God. And uh, in his prayer at the very end of the book, uh, we see that faith and that trust in God. He says, though the uh, fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fruit uh, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off in the fold, and there be no herds in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my on high, on my high places. So, uh, just a beautiful prayer that, that that Habakkuk says, "I will trust God, and even if you take all those things away um, through the Babylonians, I will trust you." And I will rejoice in you, my God. And so Paul pulls that forward and he says, uh, that's how the righteous live. Um, and, and, and that's the proof that I have um, that that's what the righteousness of God brings about in the life of the believer. Um, and so really, there's not a lot of distinction between the two because, um, because Habakkuk is talking about the faith or the faithfulness of the Old Testament believer, and Paul is pulling that into the New Testament and saying the faith or faithfulness of the New Testament believer needs to be the same, um, that it needs to be based on trust in Christ um, and 
and it needs to weather the storms of life. So he's now set the stage uh, for um, the, I guess, fleshing out of this theme, the gospel theme. He's set it out. He's told us it's a righteousness of God um, that's being revealed, um, that is received by faith, and, uh, and that those who are faithful to God, those who truly trust in God, are going to live by that faith. And now he's going to explain in detail all that that means. So he's now set the stage for what is to come. <clears throat>